explorations, probing global diversification. We travel the world so you don't have to. What magic created these little diamonds in the night sky? In this show, a physics professor will talk about how stars are formed and the important role they play in the formation of a galaxy. Also, an astronomer will discuss how the constellations were important navigation tools in ancient times. He will also talk about the difference between astrology and astronomy. And we will hear from a star sound specialist about how each star carries its own unique sound and how they may affect us. What are the elements that contribute to the formation of a star? Listen to Christine Wilson, physics professor at McMaster University, talk about how stars are formed. And the pulses they emit is what astronomers will study to follow the life cycle of a star. Learn about pulsars and how they can play an important role in the formation of a galaxy. She will discuss the science behind the star and how we are able to get the sound of a star. I mean, this is kind of perhaps a far-reaching question, but or maybe it's not. Maybe it's quite simple. How are stars formed? Well, we think we understand the basic outlines of how a star like our sun forms. Uh, it starts off with a region of space that contains um, a lot of gas, and that region of space needs to have enough uh, of a concentration of matter that it becomes unstable under its own gravity, so that the force of gravity trying to pull the matter in towards the center gets larger than the pressure and other things that are trying to hold it up and keep it from collapsing. So when you get enough matter in a small volume, it will start to collapse. Um, and ultimately, that collapse will lead to a star like our sun if there's enough mass present. Along the way, what happens, though, is the cloud of gas often has um, some rotation associated with it. And so as it collapses, it starts to spin faster and faster. And this spinning causes the collapse to not proceed in a sort of fully spherical fashion, but the, the matter collapses down to, uh, to form a disk, a flattened structure. You can kind of think of this like a dinner plate that's rotating. Um, and then matter keeps funneling into the center through the disk. And the formation of that disk is actually really important um, for two things. One of the things is that it, uh, it generates large outflows of material out the centers of the disk that act to carry away some of the material and also this angular momentum, the rotational energy as well, gets carried away. Um, but also those disks are where planets form. Um, and so as the, as the material comes into the center, it gets denser and denser and hotter and hotter and eventually gets hot enough that nuclear fusion starts. And at that point, you've formed a star. And you may be going on to continue to form planets in the disk, but eventually the energy from the star um, and the fact that it runs out of material at the large scales will cause the star to stop accreting matter and it will blow away the gas in the disk. And if you're lucky, you're left with a star with a system of planets around it. What about the material itself that makes up stars? Is it, is, it, is it the same fundamentally throughout the universe, or can we have different types of material uh, making up uh, uh, different stars? Well, stars are primarily composed of the two main elements of, that are, make up most of the universe, which is hydrogen and helium. Um, and then they have trace amounts of heavier elements. Uh, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are, are, are some of the main ones. Iron is another main element in stars. So when we look at stars um, in the universe or even in our own galaxy, the fact that they have lots of, they are mostly hydrogen and helium, that remains constant. But how much of the remainder is in these heavier elements like carbon and iron, that 
that varies. And it seems to vary with the age of the star. So the older stars have less carbon and iron in them than the younger stars. And the picture we have for why this is true is because hydrogen and helium come from the Big Bang, uh, but no element heavier than lithium, which is the seventh element in the periodic table, is formed in the Big Bang. And so the carbon and the oxygen and the iron that we see in stars today had to form in an earlier generation of stars. And so as time goes on in the universe, there's more and more of the heavier elements around, and they're available to be captured in these forming stars. Is there a particular time when the star is being formed when the energy is more concentrated? Um, no, I don't, I don't really think so. So the energy as the star is being formed comes out in different ways. So in the early phases when a star is being formed, when it isn't burning, um, uh, doing nuclear fusion in its center yet, the, the gas, uh, the material that's forming the star is getting quite dense and warm, but it's still nowhere near as warm as our sun. And so as a result, that uh, what we call a, a protostar, because it's going to be a star, but it isn't yet, that protostar emits its radiation not as visible light, but at longer wavelengths into the infrared. So uh, it's more like it's producing heat energy like a fire would uh, than um, visible light. Now, fire is not a great analogy because it also produces light, obviously. But so these stars, when they're protostars, you actually can't see them or often can't see them with optical light telescopes. You have to use infrared or radio telescopes to find them. They, as they evolve, they go through a phase as they're sort of settling down. When they're very young, they can be very active. They can have lots of star spots on their surface, kind of like the, the sunspots, but often bigger. And along with those uh, star spots, there can be flares. And so those young sort of unsettled teenage stars can be putting off um, ultraviolet radiation and X-ray radiation primarily in these flares. And this is actually one of the things that affects and destroys the disk around the young star is the energy from this, um, this X-ray radiation, in particular from the flares. What about the lifespan of a star? Do they usually last for at least a specific time? Okay, so um, so a star like our sun will burn hydrogen in its center for about 10 billion years. And once it's done uh, burning hydrogen in its center, it starts to burn hydrogen in a shell around its core, but it goes through a lot of structural changes that causes it to get bigger and cooler and then brighter. And eventually it goes through some pulsations, sheds its outer envelope, uh, becomes a white dwarf star and cools away into oblivion. And all those phases after it finishes burning its fuel in its center add about 10% to the lifetime of the star only. So astronomers tend to think about the period of time that the star burns hydrogen in its center as being the life of the star. So for our sun, that's about 10 billion years. For more massive stars, so a star that's say 30 times the mass of our sun, it burns at much higher temperatures. It has more fuel to burn, but it uses it up so much more quickly that its lifetime is only about 30 million years. And then there are stars less massive than our sun, say 30% uh, the mass of our sun, where their lifetime is longer than the age of the universe. So every one of those stars ever formed is still around today. So the lifetime is known, uh, and, and can, be, can be measured and modeled quite well using models of the internal structure of stars, uh, but it depends on the mass of the star. Nina was uh, discussing the whole idea of, uh, uh, of stars emitting sounds and that, that, that uh, these sounds can be listened to or measured. Uh, talk a little bit about that, please. Uh, well, so the idea of a star emitting a sound, I think, is a little is a little bit complicated. So first of all, a sound wave like we have on Earth needs a medium to travel through. So there can be sound waves inside a star, but those sound waves can't get to us as a sound wave because between the star and us, there's a vacuum. There's no medium to carry the sound wave, okay? 
So if people think about sound waves from a star, there are a couple of different things that occur to me when you say that. Um, the first is that a star like our sun has some uh, large-scale, low-level oscillations going on inside it. Um, it's kind of, um, it's almost like it's ringing inside, pulsating back and forth. And uh, it's been a while since I've read about this, but I feel like the main um, period of those oscillations is about five minutes. So if that, if you translated that into a sound wave, uh, it would be very, very, very low frequency, being too low for us to hear. Um, a typical sound that we hear on Earth is about, um, oscillates about 400 times per second. So that's one over 400 um, uh, seconds is its period. The other type of sound that people might be referring to is pulsars. So pulsars are the dead remains of some massive stars they're extremely high density. Um, they have very strong magnetic fields, and they spin very fast. And so as a part of this very rapid spinning and high magnetic field, these pulsars produce uh, radio waves, and the radio waves are modulated. They come as a pulse uh, every, uh, everywhere from about every one or a few tens of seconds to down to maybe a millisecond. And so you could convert that frequency of how often that pulse arrives into an equivalent sound that we could hear. But the, but the neutron star itself isn't really producing the sound. We're, we're just taking the frequency of its pulse and converting it into an equivalent sound wave. So when people have heard, if people have heard the sound produced by a star, it may be one of these pulsar signals converted into sound. I was curious about that because I've heard some of these sounds on the uh, on the internet and I was uh, curious where that came from and wanted to clarify a few things. Okay, so so for example, so suppose you take a pulsar and we observe it with a radio telescope. So we're observing, we're measuring a signal and the signal is coming to us at radio wavelengths. So it's maybe coming to us at a wavelength of 5 centimeters, okay? Um this is actually, you know, sort of comparable to the wavelengths of our radio signals we use to transmit radio stations and GPS and that type of thing. So what that pulsar produces is a burst of radio energy once per millisecond. Okay, so if you have a very fast radio telescope, you can measure this and see energy in this millisecond, nothing for the rest of the second, energy in the millisecond, nothing for the rest of the second. Okay, so that's the signal. It's, it is a burst every millisecond. Sound waves on Earth tr have a frequency, and which is uh, the frequency of the sound wave traveling through Earth, and that is how often does um, the the sort. If you thought of it as a wave, like a wave on the ocean, how often does a crest pass by your ear? So musicians often tune their instruments to um, a frequency, I think it's A below middle C, it's a 400 or 440 hertz. So that would be, if you translate that into seconds, that's 2.5 milliseconds. So that pulsar, if you translate into frequency, would be 1,000 hertz, which is, I don't remember all my musical signatures, but it's, it's higher up the scale, but definitely still something we could hear. But it, that pulsar is not producing the sound. We're taking its signal and converting it into a sound to, to make it more accessible to people, to, to help them understand what they're hearing, or what they're, help them understand the, the information. So in other words, you couldn't tune it in without having the right equipment at this end, no. right? To translate no. it, essentially. Yeah, that's right. And, and each star has a different frequency, a different sound, or close? Right, so these Pulse. these pulsars are the primary ones that produce these types of, of um, repetitive signals, and each of them is somewhat different. They they cover a range, um, as I said, from about ten seconds to about a millisecond, uh, a thousandth of a second, um, and and they're all quite different. And it just depends on their formation history and how old they are. They tend to slow down with time. If they absorb a lot of material, then get spun up fast again, and then they slow down with time. And eventually they get so slow that they, they stop producing these bursts and then we can't see them as this type of pulsar anymore. 
John Gavro, astronomy specialist of 30 years and president of the Hamilton Amateur Astronomy Club, will share his insights about how stars have been used as an accurate map in ancient times for navigation, as well as compare the difference between astrology and astronomy. Um, before we go on, I, I guess um, uh, we should maybe explain uh, to people what the difference is between astronomy and astrology. And I think people often confuse those two terms. Uh, scientists don't, but uh, often I think people who don't pay as close a, a attention to, to the two uh, confuse them. Maybe can you just talk about those two? Absolutely, Zintar, and that's a really good point. And and being out in the uh, doing public programs and and showing uh, you know people stuff through my telescope and that I encounter that all the time. People come up and and use the wrong terminology, say astrology when they mean astronomy or vice versa, and the, the words are so similar. It's entirely understandable. And of course, they share a common root. Hundreds of years ago, astronomy and astrology were one in the same. But with a modern understanding of how science works and in the Renaissance era when the modern scientific method was introduced, the two formed, forged different paths. And astronomy, with the M, astronomy and what I uh, am involved in, is the hardcore science of it. It's the actual observation at a telescope of the stars and the galaxies and the planets and it's understanding how they work and 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 so on and astrology is is the um is the application of of that to 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 humanity and 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 to our everyday life and of course in 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 a nutshell it, what it is 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 your horoscope in the newspaper when you open up your newspaper and you read your daily horoscope that's astrology and although those 12 constellations that are listed in the newspaper are actual constellations and are up there in the sky. What you're reading there in the newspaper bears no bearing at all to the actual science of astronomy. What would you call astrology then as opposed to astronomy? Astronomy being the science, astrology is? A pseudoscience. Oh. Um, something that, uh, that uh, you know, travels in the guise of a science, but really isn't. It doesn't employ any scientific methods, and we aren't learning anything about the real world from it. So it's a pseudoscience. But if you wanted to be kinder about it, you could say it's an entertainment, I suppose. Okay. So uh, what is a constellation then? Well, that's a great question. A constellation is, um, well, it's a picture in the sky. They're the biggest, grandest dot-to-dot -dot game that uh, we can play, and we've been doing that for thousands of years. Uh, so we look up into the nighttime sky, we see a random smattering of stars, and we impose pictures onto that. Now, the constellations are completely arbitrary and artificial constructs. They're fabrications that bear no relation at all to the actual structure and physicality of the universe. But they're our guideposts. They're street signs through the night. They're literally our guiding stars. And if they tell us nothing about the true nature of the cosmos, they speak volumes about ourselves. They speak to our, our history, our culture, our morals and myths are up there, our heroes and villains. It's all spelled out for us up there in the stars. Who came up with the concept uh, or, or their multi-origins multi, multi uh, to this concept of, of, of constellations? Well, you're exactly right. There are multiple origins to, to the constellations. We see that different cultures through history and all around the world have all created their own, uh, their own constellations. Now, there is certainly a very practical reason for this. So you could imagine in ancient times, in uh, a pre-literate or illiterate society, the constellations were your calendar. So when you couldn't go to a local bookstore and buy a wall calendar full of, you know, cute kittens or something, or even if you could get one of those but couldn't read it because you were illiterate, the appearance of the night sky told you the time of year and the pairing of, say, a certain constellation with the sun or the first rising of another constellation would tell you when to plant your crops or when to expect the start of the rainy season or that the onset of a flooding river was imminent. And this was really important information. And you could determine all of that yourself just by looking up at the night sky. And so we see that in ancient Mesopotamia, in ancient China, 
in indigenous cultures in North America and South America, they've all created their own constellations that they used for these purposes. So they're like guideposts uh, for, for life and change of seasons and so on. Sort of an anthropological question, really. Absolutely, it is. And in each particular case, of course, they imposed imagery onto the stars that was pertinent to them, things that were important to them. And so looking at the different constellations that have sprung out of different cultures around the world tells us a lot about the origins of that culture and those peoples. And, uh, yeah, I guess the changing position, I have a question here. It says, how is it possible to follow the stars when they're always changing position in the sky? But uh, I would sort of reverse that and say it's the position that they look for in the sky that tells you uh, whether the time is right for, say, certain crops to be planted or, or whether, whether it's time for you to go to sleep or, you know, whether the winter is on its way, that kind of thing. That's exactly right, and that's exactly how they were used and the practical value they held. And so we can look up at the night sky now, and although we don't need to use the changing constellations for those purposes, uh, as they have done over the past millennia, uh, over thousands and thousands of years, we can still uh, use them for our own practical purposes uh, today. So, so for instance, um, I refer to them as like street signs, right? So um, they're our roadmap around the nighttime sky, and we'd, we'd be lost in the night with, with, without them. Uh, so the analogy is, that, that I often give is this. So imagine that uh, uh, Zintar and Nina, so imagine you wanted to come over to my house uh, to uh, look through my telescope, and you'd be uh, more than welcome to. But unfortunately, there are thousands and thousands of homes in the city that I could possibly live in, and one way to find me would simply be to start knocking on doors. So you could go, knock, knock, does John live here? No. Okay, knock, knock, does John live here? No. Well, very quickly, you'd become frustrated because there are simply so many uh, uh, houses and doors to knock on. You need one simple piece of information, an address. Even a street name would help tremendously. It then becomes all so simple. Uh, with a street name, instead of thousands and thousands of doors to knock on, you're down to a couple of dozen, and that's doable. Well, the constellations are like that for the nighttime sky. There are street names for the nighttime sky. So if I tell you that there is a star up there, that if you look at very closely, it is not just one star, but two stars very close together. And I would ask you to imagine being on a planet, living there, and having two suns in your sky instead of one. That would be an amazing thing. And you might want to go outside and look at, the, look at that. But when you get out there and look up at the sky, there are thousands of stars up there. And you're faced with the same problem as knocking on doors all over the city. How do you find that one star? But if I tell you the name of the constellation, if I give you basically a street name for you to look at and say that, well, it's in the Big Dipper, then instead of thousands and thousands of stars, now you only have to look at seven stars. And sure enough, there it is. The second star in the handle of the Big Dipper is not just one star, but two very, very close together. And you can go out and do that any night and look at the Big Dipper and see that for yourself. So this is the practical value that they still hold for us today. If we don't use the constellations to tell us when the river is going to flood or when to plant our crops, we still use them to guide us through the nighttime sky and show us all the marvels of the universe that we can see. You're certainly very enthusiastic about this subject. <laughs> I, I certainly am. <laughs> I, it's, um, it's, it's something that never fails to amaze and delight. I was just going to say, uh, make a point about uh, constellations too, the groups of stars that make up the constellations. They don't necessarily have to be clustered together in the heavens. Uh, they could be they could be millions of light years apart. It, uh, uh, it, it's just how we perceive them here on, on Earth that, that, that they form that little cluster that we've identified. Is that right? That's exactly right, Zintar, and that's an excellent point. It's only from our unique perspective here on Earth that we see the constellations that we do. In the reality of the universe, as we could travel out through our galaxy and out amongst the stars, we would see that some of these stars are very close to us, some are very distant, and they may not have any bearing at all to each other. 
But it is from our unique position here on Earth that we see that specific pattern and we can make these constellations. If we happen to be at on a planet circling another star, we would not see the same constellations that we do. It is very much something that is unique to us. Let me see if I understand this. So someone in Africa will see a totally different s- sky or a constellation than we will. Well, somebody in Africa could very well look at exactly the same stars and create an entirely different constellation than, than we would. Um, and they would undoubtedly impose onto, onto it imagery and ideas that were pertinent and important to them. So as an example, there are, there are 88 constellations that we use today. And most of them, 48 out of the 88, date back to the ancient Greeks. But, of course, they adopted their system from the Babylonians, and they probably borrowed heavily from the Sumerians, which is about 3,000 years before the Greeks. We can date some constellations back 5,500 years. Uh, But if we look around at other cultures, we see that, uh, um, that they also have rich histories of constellations. So of these ones, the, the ancient Greek ones that we use, of course, we're familiar with some of them, like Orion, the hunter, or Leo, the lion, uh, Hercules, of course, uh, Perseus, and, and, and Andromeda, the princess. These were things that were important to the ancient Greeks. These were, these were the hearts and, and, and roots of their stories and their mythology. So they looked up into the sky and they imposed those things up there. In different cultures, uh, like China or, you know, the Native North Americans, they've imposed different imagery and different mythology and different ideas and stories up there. And then, of course, as you mentioned, Africa, if you travel down into the southern hemisphere, you can see a different, completely different collection of stars because you're looking in a different direction out into the universe. So the Greeks see basically the same stars that we do. But if you travel down into southern Africa, you would see completely different stars. Now, many of the constellations that we that are in the southern hemisphere are ones that were imposed by the great explorers of the 15th and 16th centuries who traveled down below the equator, came face to face with completely different stars for the first time and had to come up with their own constellations. So they imposed on them things that were important to them as sailors and explorers. So we see in the southern hemisphere, instead of the, the, the ancient Greek heroes, we see parts of a sailing ship or the tools they used, like compasses or sextants. And, uh, well, it makes me wonder that if we were to name the constellations today, if we would do the same thing and name them after things that were important to us. So instead of, you know, Orion the hunter or Leo the lion, we'd have microwavium the oven or something like that. So, you know? so uh, what would happen during the day? How, how would they follow a constellation during the day? Or is it only at night they would figure out the, the, the constellation or, or the route they wanted to travel? And then during the day, they would have to figure it out? What would happen with these sailors? Fill in the gaps, maybe. I don't know. Absolutely. You're, if you're referring to the, the, these explorers, uh-huh. um, you know, traveling the world and sailing their vessels around, you're absolutely right. Of course, the stars were were their direction, were their compass, and were, they were able to, uh, to use them for navigation, celestial navigation, which is, uh, which is a fine science and art, absolutely, and, and uh, a complex one, and, and I, I you know, tip my hat to those that are skilled in it. And celestial navigation, very important. But, of course, during the day, you have something else there as your guidepost. You have the sun. And if the stars are there, of course, day and night, but we don't see them during the day because the sun outshines them so grandly. But, of course, you can also use the sun as your guidepost and as your navigation. We know it rises in the east and sets in the west, and in between it passes to either the north or the south, depending on which hemisphere you're in. Uh, the much greater difficulty, of course, is what happens if you run into a stretch of bad weather and it's cloudy night after night and day after day? Uh, then you have navigational problems. <laughs> you end up back home without realizing it. How, exactly. how, 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 uh, how difficult is it to learn to read the constellations? Well, at first it seems very daunting. Uh, because it is completely random. The stars are scattered across the sky in a completely random fashion. And imposing these arbitrary shapes onto them and then assigning them 
often challenging names that have their roots in Latin and that, uh, seems like a very, very daunting task. But in truth, it's not as bad as it sounds. So what I always recommend to people is that they start with just one, just one constellation. And, of course, you, you already know the names of many constellations. There's 12 of them printed in your newspaper every day in the horoscope section, as we mentioned. And those ones, you know, Capricornus and Scorpius and Aries and Taurus, they're all actually up there. But another one that you might be more familiar with that many people would already recognize is the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is easily visible at any time of year from here in Canada. And it's an, it's an easy one to recognize, and many people already know it. So I recommend that they start with just that one. And they can use that one to guide them on to others. So the Big Dipper is represented, of, uh, uh, represented by seven stars. And it's actually part of another larger constellation called Ursa Major, the Great Bear. But if we look at just that grouping of seven stars, four stars that make up the bowl of the dipper, and then three more that make up a handle. So it's kind of like a pot with a crooked handle, a cooking pot with a crooked handle. If you look at the very front stars of the, the, the bowl of the dipper, you can go from one to the other and carry on in that same direction, and they point directly at the North Star. So now you've found the North Star. And the North Star is the last star in the handle of the Little Dipper. So now you've found a second constellation. Fantastic. Or you might use the Big Dipper in the other direction and look at that curving handle of the Dipper. And if you follow the curve of the handle, the arc, it leads to another star called Arcturus, which is the brightest star in the constellation of Bootes, the Herdsman. Fantastic. Now you found another constellation. There's Bootes the Herdsman. And if you carry on from Bootes in the same direction, you arrive at the constellation of Virgo. And we have little memory aids to help us. So the arc in the handle of the Big Dipper creates an arc to Arcturus. And from there, a spike, a straight line drawing a spike, leads you to the star Spica, which is the brightest star in the constellation Virgo. So arc to Arcturus, spike to Spica, and now instead of just one constellation, like the Big Dipper, now you've found your way to Bootes and Virgo and Ursa Minor, and you're on your way. And you can launch off from those. So at first, it's very daunting, and it seems like a big sky, and it really is. And of course, the stars are constantly moving, and the seasons are changing. But with time, they become old and familiar friends, a comfortable place to visit on a warm summer evening or a reminder on even the coldest winter night that eventually the seasons and the stars will change and give birth, uh, you know, a rebirth to, to, to spring again. Eventually it becomes comfortable, familiar, and you'll enjoy visiting again and again. So, Go ahead, sorry. So, John, uh, what about these new stars that are being formed all the time? Do they... Do they have an effect on those constellations? Does it does it does it does the skies change? Do these constellations change or evolve? That, that's an excellent question, and the answer is yes, they do change, and they change on a grand scale. But because it is such a big, big scale, the change appears to happen very, very slowly. So, when, in the course of one lifetime, I'm not going to notice a significant change in the positions of the stars. You know, the stars of my youth will be the stars of my old age. They will be the same old familiar friends. But when we look back to some of the cultures we've been talking about, the ancient Greeks, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, we can actually tell that there are changes that have occurred since that time. So over the span of thousands of years, yes, we can see changes occurring. And, and that's something that we do have to take into account, you know. But over the course of one lifetime, no, that's not something we have to worry about. Now, Nina, something else you said is, is a really good point. There are new stars being created all the time. So one of the constellations I mentioned is Orion the Hunter. And it's uh, visible in the wintertime. Not right now. It's visible in the wintertime. But it's a very big and very prominent constellation and a very, very beautiful one. It never fails to get oohs and ahs, rich with bright stars. And Orion is the hunter, and he's depicted standing there with a club raised in his hand, a shield in another hand, and hanging from his belt is a sword. So goes the depiction in, 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 our, in our star charts and what he represents. And if you look at the stars that make up the sword that hangs from his belt, there's one that's somewhat different from the others. In a photograph, it shows up a very vivid pink. 
And if you look at it with any kind of optical aid, like even a pair of binoculars that you might have around the house, you'll notice that it is not a simple, small pinpoint of light, that it is a soft cloud, a little cotton ball floating in space. And with a telescope, what we see is that this is actually a nebula, a giant cloud of gas and dust floating in space. And it is from this gas and dust that new stars are being formed all the time. There's new stars being formed in the Orion Nebula right now. And with a nice backyard telescope, you can look at that nebula and see these brand new stars being formed. Now, of course, we're talking about things on a cosmic scale. So when I say new, what I mean, of course, is that these stars might be measured in terms of millions of years instead of billions of years, like the age of our star, our sun. Um, the other, the other thing I guess that, that, uh, that might affect our, well, I'm certain, I'm certain it does affect our ability to view constellations and, and the sky in general is the, the change, uh, um, uh, in our atmosphere, uh, pollution, that kind of thing. Uh, I go back to when I was a kid, I remember going up to the cottage, uh, and lying in, on the ground, looking up at the stars, and how how many you could see. Uh, whereas you come into the city, obviously you're going to get light pollution and all that other stuff. You you see you don't see as much. Is is it harder to pick out constellations in a really rich sky that's totally filled with stars, or are they, is it easier? Uh, that's that's a great a great point. Um, you're absolutely right. It can actually be harder to pick out the constellations from a rich dark sky. So so the one of the one one the in fact that I can think the only advantage to to the light pollution of a large city is that it allows only the brightest stars to shine through and that makes it easy to pick out the key constellations. So even within the within a large city and and the light pollution that you have there learning the constellations is still very doable. It's a great place to start. But of course, once you get up to the cottage, once you get out of the city, and it's not just the pollutants of the city, it's exactly what you said, Zintar, it's the light pollution. It's that dome of ambient light that surrounds us, that comes from advertising and parking lots and and, um, non-efficient street lighting and so on. And once you get outside of that, well, the sky becomes so much more rich. So many more stars can be seen. The Milky Way pops out, right? And the fact is that the vast majority of children growing up today don't get a chance to see the Milky Way. Uh, one of the greatest natural sights that we, that we have. One of the, the most amazing natural wonders that you can see. And it's there if only we can get away from the city lights. And so getting up to, a, to, to the, uh, into cottage country, getting out of the big city, it makes a big, big difference. But you're right, having an extra couple of thousand stars up there does make picking out the key constellations more challenging. But it's entirely worthwhile considering what else you get to see along with it. The richness of the Milky Way, star clusters, nebula, distant galaxies that all become visible under the dark sky. Well, I was just thinking back to last summer, sitting out in the backyard and and uh, looking up and sort of seeing the uh, uh, the the Milky Way. It, it it at that moment, you know, like when you let your mind float a little bit, I almost felt like the Earth at that point was a spaceship, and I was on the spaceship. I could really feel the difference. Uh, whereas normally, day to day, you know, it's this hard surface. It's flat. We don't notice the the uh the the fact that we're actually floating in space like everything else that's exactly right and and gaining that perspective is is so valuable and so rewarding and it's so easy to go through day-to-day life without looking at a bigger picture like that and when you get that opportunity to to stretch out on a on a lawn chair under the nighttime sky and 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 just gaze up it's it's so rewarding This summer, uh, of course, summer is the best time to observe the Milky Way. And this summer, one of the the nicest opportunities will come in mid-August during the Perseid meteor shower. And uh, you don't need any special equipment. You don't need a telescope, nothing like that. All you need to do is just stretch out, get comfortable, and look up at the nighttime sky. And the meteors will come. And that's in the middle of August, on the evening of August the 11th. And you can just lie back, look up, and watch for the shooting stars. 
And it's an absolutely uh, delightful way to spend an evening. Many uh, astronomy clubs will hold events. Uh, our club uh, in Hamilton will hold uh, an event at the Binbrook Conservation Area, open to the public, and everybody can come, and it's absolutely free, and there'll be telescopes to look through and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And you can sit back and watch and enjoy the Perseid meteor shower. And what a nice opportunity to just sit and gaze up at the sky. And Take that in and, and have that opportunity to see it in a different perspective and feel the Earth as what it really is, which is a planet hurtling around the sun, floating in space. It's a perspective that we don't often get to enjoy. And when that opportunity comes, yeah, you yeah, absolutely have to see it. We sent a spacecraft out a number of years ago. It was launched in the 1970s. And it, uh, the spacecraft was called Voyager, and it traveled out beyond uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and gave us our very first close-up looks at some of these planets. And it made an abundance of discoveries, and it was absolutely remarkable. And then it continued on past these planets and headed out into deep space. And the remarkable thing was that it was still operating. And a few years ago, they said, well, we're still in contact with this thing, but of course, there's nothing out there to look at, so what do we do? And they said, well, let's turn the spacecraft around, and just once, let's point it back at where it came from and take a series of photographs and see what we can see. And one of those photographs became immortalized by the great Carl Sagan, one of the, the greatest of, of, of science popularizers, where in a photograph that was pointed just to the side of the sun, and in an absolutely unremarkable, otherwise unremarkable image that was streaked with glare and light from the sun, kind of like looking through a windshield as you drive into the sunset and it's so hard to see, this featureless image, there in one of those streaks of light, of, of glare from the sun, was one tiny little speck, one tiny little, as Carl Sagan referred to it, pale blue dot. And that was the Earth. That was the Earth as seen from beyond the farthest planet. There was our spaceship floating in space, you know, hurtling around the sun along with all the other planets. And what a unique way to see it. And if you can gain even a tiny hint of that by sitting out under the night sky, gazing up at the Milky Way, m tracing your way through some of these constellations, of course, it's entirely worth it for that experience. I, I have a question. Um, if, if we could back up to the, 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 the meteor shower that's happening. Is this what's happening uh, August the 11th? Yes, that's right. Could, could you go into that a little bit and explain about uh, meteor showers and, and this one in particular? Absolutely. So meteor showers are events that occur again and again at the same time each year. And what's happening is uh, Earth is traveling in its orbit around the sun and travels around the sun once a year. And as it does so, so it passes through streams of matter. Now, these small uh, particles, these streams of particles, probably originated in comets. Comets are, are great big snowballs in space. So what you have to imagine is late or early spring and the snow is slushy and melty and you go down to the curb and in your left hand you scoop up uh, a big scoop of, of old, dirty, icy snow. And in your right hand, you scoop up some of the gravel and dirt and dust that's exposed on the road now. And you pack the two together into the most disgusting snowball that you can imagine. Now, imagine that disgusting snowball kilometers across and hurtling through space, and basically you've got a comet. Now, the Earth goes around the sun, as I said, and basically pretty close to a circle. But comets have very eccentric orbits. Sometimes they're very close to the sun. Sometimes they're very far from the sun. And when they get close to the sun, well, all of that ice, it melts. And when it melts, it leaves, the frees up the, the dust and the dirt, and it leaves a trail of debris behind it. And then the Earth in its orbit comes along and passes through that trail of debris. And we go crashing into these tiny little particles of dust and dirt. And when we crash into them, we can see the impact. We see the impact as a streak of light through our sky, a shooting star or a meteor. And, of course, we see it so clearly because we're impacting at such high speeds. We might impact um, a meteor at 30 or 50 or even 100 kilometers a second. Not 100 kilometers an hour like you're driving down the highway. 100 kilometers a second. That's a tremendous speed, and when it impacts, it releases a tremendous amount of energy. And we can see that as light in the sky. And so we see this streak of light, a shooting star, 
passing across the sky. Now, you might see one of those on any night. You might see one tonight. It can happen any time. And the only way you'll see it is if you have your eye on the sky. But there are certain nights, like August 11th, as you just mentioned, when we pass through streams of material where there's a tremendous number of these little particles, and we get a whole bunch of meteors or a whole bunch of shooting stars all in one night. And it's so much fun to go out, sit back, look up, and wait for the shooting stars to come. Each one, each time we pass through one of these streams, it's very predictable because the stream is in a certain location, and we reach that location on the same day every year. So on the night of August 11th every year, you can go out and see the Perseid meteor shower. But there's others throughout the year as well. In November, there's the Leonid meteor shower. In December, there's the Geminid meteor shower. There's plenty all, all through the year. But of course, the one in August is so nice because it's always such a warm summer evening and it's nice to lie outside. So, so a, a shooting star is, is a meteor? Or Absolutely a right. It's exactly the same thing. Donald Adams, otherwise known as Doc Stars engineer and star sound master. He is committed to sharing the beauty of the sound that emits from the stars. He will talk about his work and give some examples of how they have been used for health. His simple fascination with stars has now grown into a beautiful obsession to help mankind. The basic premise is simple. Um, and the premise is simply that you know, when we say frequency, when we say resonance, uh, frequency is simply um, really just a, a rate of uh, motion over time. How fast is something moving? Um, and, and to derive a frequency conceptually is very simple. Um, all we're doing is we're taking the inverse of a dimension. And that's a unit measure usually of length. So what you, know, what you could literally say is if, if you had, say, like a, a broomstick, and the broomstick is two meters long, you know, what, what frequency would you come up with to make that broomstick physically vibrate? Well, all you would do is you would just say one divided by its unit length. Now, that's simplified, of course, but, I mean, that's essentially the idea. What happened with me was I, I began, as the years passed, continued my own experimentation, and I had a few realizations when I was in this through a series of events that happened, and... Um, and I suppose uh, some, some accidental discoveries. Um, but one thing that occurred to me was that although the Rife community at large has an annotated list of frequencies for all kinds of different things, like so if you want to kill a spider in your backyard, you can find a frequency bank that, say, lists like six frequencies in hertz. And all you do is you just play each of these frequency banks over a, a period of time, and you... You play it at a certain amplitude, and that spider is, is a goner. Just out. Fox News came out about five years ago, talking about how lovely this new discovery was. And the discovery was basically that we can shake viruses to death now with frequencies. And they were talking about how this guy at some university with a stamp of approval on him had just discovered that you can uh, take a laser and modulate the laser with a frequency that is resonant to a virus uh, protein shell and you can crack it wide open. And the way that they were talking about was that, you know, we're, we're not really sure yet about how much this can be applied, and it's brand new science. They've just discovered it. And, you know, don't try this at home because the only way that, that it works is you have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars of, you know, laser equipment. And it's just, it was just I was watching this dumbfounded. But here's the thing that I, I found that was odd. Um, as this was unfolding, uh, there was no serious mention of the effect of uh, frequency or frequency modulation on consciousness or on emotions. So, you know, uh, there would be hundreds and thousands of case studies done where someone was, was uh, experimenting with frequency mod modulation on, a, say, a disease state. Um, and they might say, you know, mention that there was uh, just in passing that they maybe, you know, felt a certain way emotionally or, or et cetera, et cetera. And I thought that was very strange, and I thought, you know, there must be a crossover uh, between the use of frequencies and this technology, and all it really required was to go into different disciplines and domains to discover that something along those lines was happening. So what I started to do is I started to try to connect some of these dots, and I started to think, well, wouldn't it be interesting 
if we could modulate and change our internal mental and emotional states dramatically through frequency. And if that's the case, then what does that mean? And is it already happening in nature? Has it been happening? Is there a record of this? I'd be out someplace with friends, you know, like we'd be having a coffee at Chapters or I'd be walking down to you know, doing some shopping in a mall. And I would just, like a charley horse or an ache in the middle of my feet, it would just drive me crazy. And it would get me so bad that I would be walking on the edges of my feet or, you know, it would just horrible. And it would last for 45 minutes to a couple hours. I went, I went to the computer console and I, I started to think, like, how can I do this? How can I model what's going on in my feet? And, and, and how would I model a transition stage? How would I model, like, my feet feeling better? So I began to try to model uh, what seemed to within the confines and context of its framework, uh, be both an internal change and also an external uh, correspondence to the change. Um, and I merged the two. So I was looking at, within the confines of my model, what kind of radiations or what kind of influences from a stellar basis might have that kind of generalized effect, and what might that look like uh, as you know, partially on a graft form, but also again within the context of my model of state change of the pain leaving my feet. I just whipped this together. It was just, it was basically, by the time it was done, I had uh, a raw sequence of numbers that charted a, a transition, you know, from state of pain to state of wellness. And then I, I, I whipped up a little quick uh, primitive, very, very primitive programming code to sonify the data. Just convert the data, the raw number sequence, just the number sequence itself, into sound. So I ran this thing, and it sounded pretty rough, and it was like chirps and beeps and bops and burbles. Uh, a little bit annoying, uh, but not horrible. It, you know, it had a slightly melodious quality to it. And I just put it on, it turned my speakers up, and I let it run in the background. Uh, anyway, after three and a half hours passed, I... Um, had an, I had a very unusual feeling, uh, something I hadn't experienced before. And um, uh, it felt as though there was a burning sensation going on in my feet. I started to panic, <clears throat> and I felt like I've got to call a doctor. I've got to get to the clinic. And I thought, what, what can I even tell the doctor? It's like, oh, listen, I was sitting at my computer, and I was, like, cranking up these weird tones. Can you fix me? Am I okay? You know, so... Anyway, after probably about 45 minutes to an hour, uh, the sensation stopped, and uh, my feet were no longer sore, and, um, and the condition uh, went away. Any idea why uh, the sounds would have targeted your feet specifically and not other parts of your body? The, the data that uh, uh, was rendered into a sonified version was data that was meant to cause transition in my feet. It was meant to be like, here is a representation of what a sore foot looks like data-wise, and then here's a representation of the foot not feeling sore, and then the transition data sequence in between. This, this was the idea that I just plugged into it, right? All I knew was that my feet were no longer sore, and I was a bit freaked out, and so I contacted about, I don't know, maybe like close to a dozen or just under a dozen different groups online. And I and I just I just told them straight up. I said, "Hey, this is who I am. This is what I've been doing. I'm a little bit freaked out. Looking for some volunteers. Would you mind stepping up and giving me a hand?" So about forty people responded and said, "Yeah, well, sure, lay it on us. You know, like we'll try your stuff out." I gave them a bunch of you know free tracks, and they just decided that they were going to experiment with. And didn't hear anything back for about three or four days. And so I thought, well, maybe if nothing's happened, I, just, you know, I shouldn't even be you know worrying about this. Then about the fourth or fifth day, I had about five or six people running back, and they were also really excited and freaked out. It's like, oh, my God, what's in this? You know, how is this doing this? So then I was just like, okay, like, I'm screwed now. I'm, I'm into it. So I, I began to take the rudimentary primitive model, and I began to try to, like, extend it. And our group grew very fast. Uh, I think probably within, I'm guessing, about three months, we went from 40 people to about 350 and then, you know, that's expanded, and, and so now we're at about uh, 2,200 people on our Yahoo group, 500 on our Facebook. Uh, total, I'm 
uh, our main YouTube channel's got about 4,500 subscribers, and then we've got two or three other channels with, I don't know, like a couple of thousand in there. And uh, people are asking if I can design different kinds of frequency tracks or different kinds of things, and, and that's basically supporting the work. All I know is that we're in situations where people that have these uh, different kinds of disabilities or conditions come to us, and they seem to be telling me that they're feeling remarkably better because of these frequencies that we're making. Um, so, but I, what seems to happen is that when a person has some kind of physical dysfunction, whether it's an illness or if it's uh, a condition, it's as though in, in most cases there's always, it's like a dent in their psyche. It's like a dense uh, in emotional expression. So, so how did you uh, become interested in the, the sound from the stars? Uh, behind both the motion of the planets and much of the radiation um, that, that we get you know, from space, including stars, and um, the patterns that we see in the passage of planets and stars, I was finding corresponded to that inner state. Remember what I had mentioned before was that what I was trying to do was figure out what kind of you know, influence, energetic influence, may elicit or trigger certain responses that are uh, uh, beneficial or detrimental to an organism. Um, and if we take a look at, for instance, the orbit of Venus, uh, and we graph the orbit of Venus, we come up with a highly coherent and structured geometry, which has been studied by numerous people and proven. And what we see is a very distinctive uh, pentagonal formation. Uh, so we see that the relationship of the orbit of Venus to the v uh, observer on the Earth uh, would look like a pentagonal structure. And what I began to find was that the internal states of different kinds of um, positive, you know, plateaus or, you know, peaks or valleys and also um, negative ones, uh, like negative states, would correspond to different kinds of structural form. So uh, what was interesting was the negative states had a tendency to go to um, either increased entropy or they would go to a null point. And uh, states of, uh, of a positive nature would be either a, a fairly beautiful complex geometry with a little bit of chaos thrown in, or they would be a structured order pattern with a very curious blending of chaos throughout it. And there was a, a very uh, a cool paper I came across a while ago that had to do with, you ever heard of jogger's death? You know, someone's jogging, and they're, they're, they're very good at jogging, and then they just suddenly keel over one day. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, you wonder, what, what, how, how does this healthy person just die? How did that happen? Sure. And what they found was that the most likely thing was that the heart didn't have any room. Uh, this is going to sound silly at first, but I'll explain the heart didn't have any room for healthy chaos. There was like a, a repetitive structured strain being put onto the body and onto the heart. And what happened was the periodicity of the heart went to a null point. It was too much for it. So if the jogger, instead of just jogging, you know, steadily, this repeat pattern, very rigid and, and you know, and, and stringent, um, if he had played, if he had jumped a little bit, if he had jogged and, done different kinds of activity, you know, been creative, um, he probably wouldn't have died. And they actually would chart, and I, I've seen the, the graphs and charts of this, fascinating to watch, is that when you have a very healthy person, so they're healthy emotionally, they're, they're healthy physically, healthy you know, mentally, the, the chart of the heart it looks very beautiful and symmetric. It's very harmo harmonic, but it has a little bit of chaos in there. It has room to be expressive, room to be a little bit crazy. But the heart that's unhealthy becomes overly structured and rigid, and then it goes down to a still point, and then it just expires. And so these patterns of geometry, we see them in the sky, and we also have them in our body. And I know that this is the case because there's an instrument that I developed um, to refine my frequency process, and I could, I could view the topology in real time of uh, the patterning of some of these states. And I was like, oh, my God. And sometimes they would look like cardioids, like they would look like, like literally kind of like you know, the math or a cycloid. And other times they would look like um, 
different kinds. It's, it's, it's very curious to watch it. It's like it's watching a, it's like watching a platonic solid unwrapping itself, uh, but dynamic and in motion. And I was but like, this is the same thing that I'm seeing in the sky. Um, and then when this data was sonified, um, the effects that would be elicited with people uh, could be pretty profound. We had, we had some really intense, um, we've had a number of intense reports from people. And we've had a few small labs do studies of things like um, the change of blood terrain. Uh, so we know, we know that the frequencies are actually having a, a physical effect. You know, like we, we've seen uh, blood, uh, blood in a state of rouleau, you know, go, uh, go from a, a very high rouleau state to an almost non-existent. And this is within three hours. Um, you know, so, yeah. But, but why the stars? Why did you... Is, is it because uh, I've heard each star is different, has a different st- sound? Well, here's, here's one thing that, that was a little bit problematic for me. Uh, when I was trying to synthesize and merge everything. Um, with respect to my mentor, realizing that, say, from an astrological point of view, that there was probably some degree of value there, I didn't think, because it, you know, astrology also has a lot of fiction in it. Uh, it has a lot of, you know, folklore and um, sort of superstition. In my approach, I wanted to be very scientific, and I and I had wondered... Well, look, you know, what's the likelihood of being able to use astrology as a comprehensive lexicon when I'm working with actual stars in the sky? And I found that wasn't the case. Uh, I found that that there was a, there was only a small percentage of um, of match of matching going on there. So, if if I were to give you an answer from an astrological perspective, I don't think that would be entirely accurate. If I gave you an answer that was purely only astronomical, then some of the information would be missing. If you ask someone you know, say from Cambridge that was an astronomer and was using a radio telescope um, about the effects of, uh, on health of stars, they would look at you blankly, you know, or they would give you a very generalized, you know, for public consumption answer. And they may or not may not believe much about that. But what I can say is this, um, from what I've seen so far, uh, some stars do seem to elicit um, uh, energetic properties that have uh, a very distinctive effect on health, and I'm not the only one. It's it, it's interesting because as I go through this, when I reach and pass a milestone, I become aware after the fact that there are other people in mainstream institutions that are making the same conclusions, which is good because it means I don't feel like I'm going nuts or that I'm a complete crankpot. Uh, but again, on that citation page, I believe it should be on there, there's an article that talks about a group of scientists um, that are investigating uh, the use of certain frequencies from stars to get rid of cancer. Now we know how a star is born and the important role it plays in the formation of a galaxy. We understand more about the difference between astrology and astronomy and the unique sound each star has and how they may affect us. Special thanks to Christine Wilson of McMaster University. Thank you to John Guovro of the Hamilton Amateur Astronomers Club. Their website is amateurastronomy.org. A big thank you to Doc Stars. He can be found at soundofstars.org. And thank you to you, our audience for making this show possible. Please send us your suggestions and comments. For more information about this show, please visit our website at zintarsurs.com. Thank you to my co-host, Zintar Sirs. I'm Nina Hilger, and you've been listening to our Space Continuum. <laughs>